What am I going to talk about today? That's an unusual title for a message. What do you think's going on? Now, I have something unusual that I'm going to ask you to do. On the first page of your bulletin, that's just inside the cover, there's a blank spot. And I'm asking you in a, in a genuine desire to hear from you, I'm asking you to answer the question I have, okay? So I, I have a question. This is what I'm asking you to write. And if you don't know how to write, then you can draw a picture of your question. Uh, at the end of the service, I would like to collect these covers. Now, I realize, you kids, that you need your bulletin to get some pizza, so what you can do is you can rip off the cover and give me the cover with the inside sheet, and then you can take the rest of your drawings down to get your pizza. But I would really appreciate. Here's the question. Write out one question that you would really like to ask if Jesus sat down with you and said, if you could ask me just one question today, what would that be? Now, I realize that's imaginary, and I didn't know Tim was going to be in an imaginary visit with Jesus and the communion message. <laughs> but uh, the truth of it is you can sit down and talk to Jesus and talk to your Father and ask your questions any time. But this is an exercise, and I'm, I, the reason why I'm collecting them is because I would like to just hear from you all what you're thinking, what, 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 what your desires are. You don't have to write your name on it, and uh, if you want, you may. But um, what would you ask Jesus if you, he sat down with you face to face and said, okay, you get one question. What's one question you would like to ask me? So I'd like you to do that and turn that into me. And if for some reason uh, that doesn't seem like something you want to do, then, and no, Nanny, you can't ask the question you always ask. You can't ask that. It has to be more thought to it than why am I still here? <laughs> so um, now, in the bulletin, uh, I have some things, re reflections on the wound, but first of all, there's, there's a, a, a little bit of a prelude. I guess I didn't give you guys the prelude, did I? I, I forgot, I apologize. So you don't have the prelude. <clears throat> um, so first, a little, a little bit of context. We're living in very different days. Every person that I know, that knows Christ, they're all abuzz with the same general kind of question. What do you think? What, what do you think about the political culture that's demanding this and demanding that? What, what do you think? Is this possible? Is this, is this similar to what maybe the Bible has talked about in Revelation, etc.? And <clears throat> I think the good news that I'm hearing is people are thinking. But when everybody's asking the same thing, not, well, not everybody, everybody that I'm acquainted with that I talk to asks the same sort of thing and they're just a general concern. What's, what's going on? What do I think's going on? Um, I think that's good. Now, uh, I chose, I could have done it today, but I chose not to, maybe I should have. But sometimes I put in the bulletin a little calm box for you to reflect on yourself and also some other, other kinds of documents, I mean, tools to think with. But I want you to understand this morning that the Word of God has much less capacity to minister to you if you're not paying attention to what's going on in your own life, what your needs are, what your struggles are, what your fears are. If you're not tuned in to yourself, the scripture has very little capacity to enter into your life because the scripture is for us it's the very sustenance, it's the very nourishment of our life. As we were sharing communion again this morning, 
Thanks for that hymn choice, Nana. I love that hymn. As we were sharing that, <clears throat> I remembered one of my favorite verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 where Paul simply says, we have the sentence of death in ourselves so that we don't trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Most of us don't go around thinking about um, whether we're going to be raised from the dead. But we do have this body of flesh. We do have this body of sin. We do have this body that it says in 1 Corinthians 15 that, uh, I'm sorry, no flesh. There's no flesh that's going to see God. And this body itself, <clears throat> when it speaks of one of our favorite topics, the rapture and being taken to heaven and resurrection from the dead. When we, when we look at that in Romans, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 15, it explains to us very plainly that this mortal has to put off its mortality and it has to be clothed with immortality. And so there's this straining and, and longing that we have to be clothed upon with our glorious body. So. When we're in a time of uncertainty, there's always an increased sensitivity that provides an opportunity for us to be reflective and thoughtful. And I'm just so grateful for the Word of God and how it can enter in to our inner being and, and give us perspective and give us hope. But all of the hope that we have <clears throat> We don't hope that God will prevent trouble for, from us. You know, another way of, take, of, of saying what, what Tim said this morning in the communion message, we're all walking around as dead men. That, that's who we are, we're, we're dead men and there's nothing that we have in this physical apparatus of our humanity that is going to go with us. It's a temporary vessel and this vessel is going to be put off and we're going to be clothed upon with a spiritual body which will be like Jesus' body but it'll be totally separate and different from. So I want you to just follow with me a couple passages here in an introduction. Ecclesiastes 9.12 I want you to consider this, now consider this, no one knows when their hour will come. It's Fisher caught in a cruel net pause. Jesus helped the apostles catch fish. Did you ever think that that was a cruel net they threw out? How is a net cruel to fish? Because that net is going to cost them their life. Their life as they know it, the free swim for all that they've been enjoying is, is finished. A fisher caught in a cruel net or birds taken in a snare. So people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly on them. So I want us to just pause. What do you think's going on? What do you think's going on in, in the world we're living in and in your world? And bigger yet, how are you going to process it? What's, what's your response to this? And how are we going to then live in light of it? Proverbs 28.1 says, The wicked flee, though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. I want to tell you that you'll never be bold like a lion until you have the confidence and the comfort that the scripture brings, where, where you can be absolutely certain and sure of what God is doing and how he's doing it and why he's doing it. It's beyond my absorption to see all these kids next to you, Abby. Did you have them all overnight? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't have interrupted myself. Here, here's a really good one. Many seek an audience with the ruler. But it is from the Lord that one gets justice. 
That's powerful information. In the early days of our homeschooling ministry, I spent countless hours seeking audiences with rulers. And I s used countless tools by which I could access getting an audience with rulers. But the shocking thing to me was that all of my efforts, they're not what God used to bring about the results that I was hoping for. The Lord himself just changed hearts, dictated people, and things went around, and it was, it was finished. So think about this. Think about this. I've asked you to write a question down. If you could, if Jesus was sitting in front of you, now the reason why I say if Jesus was sitting in front of you is because you're not going to think about it otherwise. I mean, we can imagine if Jesus was literally sitting right in front of us, what would we ask? <laughs> we would first of all be like all the Old Testament saints. <laughs> the first thing that he would have to say to us is, don't fear, it's me. Don't be afraid. But what, what, would you, what would you really think? What would you really ask? What would you really like to know? As a child, I probably would have asked him if they have horses in heaven. That was, at least that's what I told my mother I would ask him. <laughs> that was one of my concerns or questions. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 1, verse 18. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow, and the more knowledge, the more grief. Now, I want to, that captured my focus because when you and I have the wisdom of the scripture, and we really have a better understanding, when we ask the question, what's going on, it brings us much more sorrow as we anticipate the potential grief that's right around the corner, potentially, for mankind on the, on the face of the earth and for believers as well in the process. <clears throat> but you're accountable for what you know. And you're required to walk in it. And though you have grief and sorrow, yet still you'll be bold as a lion. So if I had a memory verse for you today, it would be this verse here in Jeremiah 1. It's actually, I think it's verses 4 and 5. So if you would read this together with me, it's in the bulletin, it's on the screen. So here's the memory verse. I don't do a very good job leading memory verses, sorry, but we'll try. Here we go. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah 1, verses 4 and 5. Let's, let's say it again. It was kind of like, are you there? Let's go. Here we go. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah 1, verses 4 to 5. Thank you. So <clears throat> I want to just talk a little bit about, now why are, we, why are we doing Jeremiah? And are we going to do the whole book of Jeremiah? And the answer is, I don't know. I have six series of sermons prepared. Each one is about seven or eight ser sermons. And I'm like, I have no idea which one I should do. So this morning I'm dabbling in Jeremiah. And I hope the, hope the Lord will give me direction as we go along to something that, that keeps the edification at its max for us all at this time we live in. But <clears throat> as we go on, I want to talk a little bit about the womb. So getting back to the verse, it says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to nations. So we have this testimony. And what's the first thing you might think of when you see those verses? I know the first thing that I would have thought of as I was a, ch as a child. First thing I would have thought of as a child is, oh, I wish God knew me in the womb before I was formed. I wish he had sanctified me in the womb before I was born. I wish he had ordained me to be a prophet before I was born. 
That's how I would have thought as a child. <clears throat> but the question is, what are you thinking? And, can, and how do we apply this? And, and I do want to uh, acknowledge up front that as we go through Jeremiah, my primary goal is not uh, academic interpretation of the passages of Jeremiah, but practical application of the text as it, as it benefits you and me. So I have some verses on the womb. I don't have them all, and I tried to keep it to a limited amount. And this might all that we get through today for our, for our practical focus. But I want us to think about something. Did he not, did not he that made me in the womb make him? And did he not fashion us in the womb? Now, there's a little context to Job 31, 5, 15. And the little context is this. Job was a very wealthy man. And in the context of that era and time, um, they didn't have businesses and they didn't have employers. They had blessed families and then there would be servants who would attach themselves to those families as a part of uh, being a part of their prosperity on the one hand, on the other hand, um, helping to promote the prosperity of the family. So Job in, the prior, in a prior verse was talking about, now, Job 31 is one of my favorite passages of Job because it's a reflection on his life. He's in the gravest condition physically. Uh, he'd already declared that he wished he was dead because his troubles were so sore. But as he's going through, when, when he gets to 29 and gets into 31, he's asking, just asking questions about reflecting back on his character. And he's basically saying, if I've mistreated my servants, isn't there a God in heaven who knows? And then he brings this point of reference. Did not he that made me in the womb make him? Did he not fashion us in the womb? Now, as I began reflecting on some of these passages, I suddenly recognized that to God, the womb is a very sacred place. It's a very sacred, um, I almost would call it, shrine as it were to place where God himself does work that has populated the world and has given man not only opportunities but um, in one sense of the word equality begins in the womb because God is the one that formed us and fashioned us in the womb now, I want to just pause for just a second. I know that biologically speaking, we quite understand now a lot more about how a child is formed in the womb and how, they, uh, how the cells divide and multiply and how the child becomes, uh, uh, it takes about nine months for that full fruition and development of the child. We understand that. But God is taking credit for that. God is taking credit for that. So now I just want to ask you one question. Are you here? Hello, are you here? If you're here, raise your hand. I see some people that didn't raise their hand. You're not here, where are you? So, if you're here, you're a product of that sacred chamber of the womb. And in that sacred chamber of the womb, God began your life and he began his work in you and the question is well, what do you think about your life and what do you think about that place of origin that sacred place where God himself knit you together Psalm 22 I was cast upon you from the womb you are my God from my mother's belly <clears throat> Now, that's King David writing one of his psalms, and I would probably prefer to hear what Tim thinks of it than what I think of it. But being that I'm not a psalm scholar, I'll just tell you my crude thinking. Um, when you and I have no capacity of our own to help ourselves, 
We are entirely cast upon God for his provision and his care and his work in our life. And David realized that from the very time he was in his mother's womb, nothing, there was nothing of his mind, nothing of his will, nothing of his preference that could influence what God was doing. God, he was totally dependent on God, though, in that sense of being in the womb. I'm sure he probably, well, I should say probably. I think he probably wasn't thinking about how he was being formed. And I don't know that he was praying in the womb while he was being formed. It's just a matter of utter, absolute dependence on God. <clears throat> now, I don't like the next verse, and I was really tempted to take it out and not use it. So that made me stick it in. <laughs> Psalm 58.3 says, The wicked are estranged from the womb, and they go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Now, Tim did an excellent job in the communion message to give background to what that passage means. But in Adam, we all die. In Adam, that, that sinful nature of Adam, it's, it's our inheritance. And so, where there's one passage that says, I was conceived in iniquity, we're estranged from the womb. We, we have a natural disconnection from God. It is easier and more natural for you to be bitter and angry and arrogant, self-righteous. It's easier for you to be that than anything else because that's who you are by nature. That's the way you were made in the womb, sharing the, the kindred spirit of Adam, as it were. And I say, they wicked go astray as soon as they're born, speaking lies. Now, <clears throat> I'm, we're going to talk about that in just a little bit, but I want you to understand one thing. That the natural man, as Tim was sharing in, from the scriptures, born in Adam, his natural instinct is only sin always. From the time he's exit the womb, that's where it begins. Psalm 127, lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Now, that's a verse we probably all have heard a lot of because I've used it all the time. It's one of our foundational life verses for my wife and I. But pause and think of it. The, the heritage of the Lord, the fruit of the womb. That's, we'll, we'll never fully understand that until we get to heaven. That might take all of eternity. But there is such a giftedness. And reality is, yes, we live in a culture today that to some degree is so negative about children and about childbirth that many couples, when we were newlyweds, we would call them dinks. Many couples have no children at all. Do you know what a dink is? Double income, no kids. <laughs> and. Actually, that was short for Dinkleberry. Anyway, the fruit of the womb is his reward. Think about that. Think about that. And if you ask any mom that has been richly blessed with many children, she'll tell you that the natural state of having a lot of children to care for is a significant time-consuming and it seems to be burdensome, especially on occasion. And all I can say is there's, there's two kinds of moms and how they respond to it. The one that just says with enthusiasm, yes, this is my treasure, this is my heritage, and receives all of it, including all the trouble. Or the other that just focuses on all the trouble and resists it and resents it and has a much less happy life because of their resisting and resenting of it. Jeremiah 20, 18. I realize this is far ahead if we, do, do, if we do Jeremiah. Why came I forth out of my mother's womb to see labor and sorrow, that my days should be consumed with shame? But I included that here because of the opening verse. Powerful, beautiful testimony about God being particularly, singularly focused on Jeremiah in the womb. And yet, here's Jeremiah fulfilling his heavenly father's wildest dreams for him. And like Job, he's like had enough. Uh, 
Why did I ever come out of my mother's womb alive? This is, this is not the life I want. And I want us to think really closely here. This is where the natural man struggles against the spiritual man. The natural man is going to always press for some kind of significant happiness here. Some satisfaction here. Some meaningful, beneficial, joy-filled life here. That's what the natural man's going to pursue. And the sorrow and labor, uh, difficulty of life, I mean, Jeremiah is consumed with saying why? Because of his ministry. He's calling the nations into account. He's being shunned and offended uh, in so many ways. So you have a choice this morning. You have a choice this morning. Are you going to see the hand of God, the purpose of God, and the presence of God in your personal life? Are, are you going to be able to reflect and say, you know, if God knew about Jeremiah, if God knew about Job, if God knew about David, you know, I think the womb is a sacred place. God knew about me, and he put his hand on me, and you were shaped in the womb. There's, a, there's some passages in, in Old Testament prophecies that say, um, I made the lame man. God, God takes ownership of that. And the reason he can take ownership of that is because he's not trying to dole out equal happiness, as it were, to our fleshly desires. He's trying to get us to be taken above, risen above all that natural desire and to get us to desire the things of eternal heaven forever and ever. So now, tempted at this stage to just go to Psalm 139 and go through that whole psalm. <laughs> but I think that might be a little bit too long, so I'll, I'll do a shorter version of it. And I have it in the, in the bulletin here. Um, For you have possessed my reins. Oh, I'm sorry, all those things were in the bulletin up front. I'm sorry. For you have possessed my reins. So beginning in Psalm 139, down there at verse 13, the scripture, David talks about his own time in the womb and God's proactive participation in it. You've covered me in my mother's womb, and I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Stop. I want to ask a question this morning. No, I'm not going to make you stand up and tell me how many times because I don't want black dots getting on your hands. But question, when's the last time you praised God for how fearfully and wonderfully made you are? It says, marvelous all your works. That my soul knows quite well. You know, if you and I fail to worship God for how he made us, we are exiting the gates as a failure. We are exiting the gates as someone who is open to the demonic attack of Satan to criticize, to complain, to feel sorry for ourselves, to wish we had better things, to envy others who we imagine has things better than we do. I will praise you. I will praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, that my soul knows quite well. <clears throat> I have a need for taking a pretty hot shower every day. I've got a little skin condition, and I'm real, ever since I was a little boy, I got diaper rashes, and I was hard to keep out of rash my whole life. But I find taking a shower every day helps <clears throat> from my scalp down. And um, I was just commenting this morning how I have to take a shower every day and explaining why. And, and my wife told me, well, have you thanked God for the modern technology that allows you to take a hot shower every day? <laughs> and that was just a good stopper. Like, oh, yeah, that's, that's true. 
praise you, praise you. I have needs and you provide for my needs, time and again in so many ways. Now, pay close attention because God's talking about you just as well as he's talking about King David, as King David is reciting this. He says, my substance was not hid from you. When I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the, quote, lowest parts of the earth, unquote. <clears throat> there are so many places, so many times in your life that just as you were in your mother's womb, the reality of what's going on in your life is totally obscured to everybody around you. And it's hidden in the secret place. And God sees it and he's watching. And what's really important for you and I to recognize is that God sees and he's watching and hello, he would like you to come to him and speak to him and say, Lord, here's my situation. Uh, first of all, I don't think I've thanked you for how well I've made. I mean, and just start listing all the things of how wonderfully you've been made. And if you need help, go back to the old proverb. I complained that I had no shoes until I met a man that had no feet. Learn how to thank God for your circumstances, for what you do have. Don't focus on what you think you don't have. Focus on what you do have because that's your heritage. It's your special heritage. Um, most of us know Johnny Eric Santada and she has said in recent years time and again, she said, I would never ever give up the precious life that I've had knowing God and walking after him that I gained from losing my ability to walk. I'd never give it up. It's been hard. She's not saying it's not hard. It's just that the gain. And so here's what you and I have to understand in this process. God's substance, your substance wasn't hid from God. And so when something went wrong, it didn't go wrong. It went right according to his plan. And that rightness, according to his plan, is intentional to help you seek his face, to walk after his ways, in all honesty and all integrity. Now, I just want to make one quick comment. Sometimes I'm just totally amazed at the poetic power of the Old Testament writers. <clears throat> but this phrase, in the lowest part of the earth, is, is a reference to the creation of man, it's used one other time by Job when he's speaking of his own self <clears throat> and he used it in a reverse poetic. But it's a way of referring to the womb, but it's looking at the womb as the place that you came forth from the place that God made us. And so when God wrought Adam, what did he do? He took dirt and formed it into man and blew in it the nostril of life. And so the lowest part of the earth here in that foundational sense is in your mother's womb. And I just, I love the poetry of it. Your eyes did see my substance while yet being formed. Now I realize today with some technology, we can have some peekaboo at the process of a child forming in the womb. Uh, but it's very limited uh, and it's very um, minuscule and we do it medically as needed. But God was watching, he saw what was going on. Now it's hard for you and I to realize that. When I started this passage with Jeremiah and God speaking about Jeremiah, I shared with you my childish mindset that as a child I would have simply said, Man, I wish God would look at me like that. I wish God had me in mind like that. And that was be my mistake as a human being. And the most important part of your spiritual well-being is that you see yourself as someone who God is intricately involved in, watching and caring, intentional, and bringing to you circumstances and those circumstances that he's bringing to you are sharply focused 
with one question, will you trust me? Will you call on my name? Will you seek my face? That's all, that's all your circumstances are for. Now, as he continues, all my, in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them formed. Now, most of you know the first miscarriage that my wife and I endured, our 11th child, and I named our 11th child, Kathib Yatzer, it's from that particular verse, written members. Uh, I just took the Hebrew words and written members. And uh, it was one of those rare occasions that, um, well, it was the first occasion on, on Roe v. Wade Pro-Life Sunday where we were remembering abortion and pr praying God's end of it. Um, I went through Psalm 139 for that purpose that day. And then at the end of the service, I happily announced that we were expecting number 11. And then at the end of that day, my wife started bleeding and we miscarried the child uh, by the end of the day, I guess it was. So I was, I was pretty devastated by it. And I remember that in my frustration, or not, not, not frustration, just dis distress is the right word. I was like, what, what, what is this? Now, the problem for me was in that as we looked upon the unformed substance of our child, I just had a problem. Is this really a child? It is, you know, the, it's such a limited amount of substance. And I had just preached on Psalm 139. Now, there's a difference between speaking and studying in, on, a, on a topic more in the third person than when it gets to the first person. And so as I'm sitting there in anguish, later that very day, going back to this passage in Psalm 139, the Holy Spirit revealed to my spirit that in God's book, all of the members of my child were written down before there was yet one of them formed. And it was like an astonishing revelation to me, but it's consistent with who God always is. God calls the things that are not as though they were. <clears throat> he announces something as if it's the end when it's hardly barely the beginning in the process of God's work. And the, the comfort for me was astounding that I recognized that my child wasn't some misshapen, misadventure that I could only, you know, wish away. But my child was fully a person, having fully accomplished the time and the purpose that God had for him in that short span of life. And for, for us, our, our need was to respond with a graciousness of joy. And I, and I was compelled with the recognition that before the throne of God, this child was already complete. I was compelled to do what I always do for every newborn child. We had a party, made a cake, and celebrated the life of our little one. And it was an incredible uh, kind of joy and, and, um, as we recognized the fullness of this child's life. And then we had the privilege of burying this child in our own little rose garden and uh, recognizing that this child is fully a child before the throne of God, even though before our eyes we haven't had a chance to see it. And so he wraps it up here. How precious also are your thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. And I stopped here with the next verse. So if I, would try, if I could try to count them up, the math would be too big for me. It'd be more than I could number. <clears throat> so now I just want to pause for a moment. And I want to bring the focus to you personally. Do you know God like that? Do you function like that? So, so let's say, okay, no, I don't know God like that. Okay, fine. That's a nice, honest answer. Um, well, how about trying to recognize God on that basis? God is fully, actively involved in your life. 
He's intentional. He knows everything about you. His works towards you have already been going on. As we get back to the actual text that is in Jeremiah here, uh, he's got stuff going on in your life that's intentional. And it's not that God's not, not paying attention to you. And how often do we cry out, well, God's so far from me. Is God so far from you? Or is it that you've wandered far from God? Because you can't even entertain the thought of his love and his care and his, and his um, ministry to you. So I want to deal with this understanding of our need. We're far away from God. First of all, in a structural sense, because our sins have separated us from him. Now, there has no child in the history of the earth ever been born that was born with his family or her family having a vital personal relationship with God like Adam and Eve had in the garden. No child ever had that. Only Adam and Eve have ever had that. They walked with God in the garden in the cool of the day, and he talked with them, and they had fellowship and relationship. Now, when you have personal fellowship and relationship with anybody, uh, you're able to get a feel and a gauge for their love for you and their interest in your life. But with sin, pff, the barrier came, and, this, and the distance was separated. So I want us to talk just a tiny bit about some of that need, because the problem isn't, is God paying attention to you like he paid attention to Jeremiah? That's not the problem. The problem is, are you paying attention to God as you can and as you ought as someone who he loves and cares for, but someone that he's requiring to make the initiative to come to him on the basis he's provided. <clears throat> Touch of scriptural child training here, Proverbs 22:15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. It's an interesting thought. The many, many, many years I've been involved in with my own family and in ministry, it's an amazing thing. It's, a, it's the most terrifying thing that I know that a parent ever has. That they love God, they value and cherish the womb and the fruit of the womb, that reward that God gives. And all they want for their children is to know God, to follow him, and to serve him all the days of their life. That's, you know, I'm speaking about, obviously, Christians who have those beliefs. But that doesn't mean those little wonderful babies that you usher into the world are without need of care. And what the text here is basically saying is real simple. <clears throat> when we're born from the wound, we're, we're immediately in a state of our own interest, our own wickedness. We're interested in lies. Now, everything, everything is a lie when it's opposed to the simple truth. Well, the first lie that a child believes is that they're the center of the universe. And they don't have much vocabulary yet, but they can cry and wail and get attention. And uh, I was astonished as a new father to realize that mothers can interpret different cries differently. Here's one cry, it's a cry to me. Oh, the diaper needs changed. Oh, he's got a bubble in his tummy. Oh, he's hungry. He's mad. <laughs> All of those little interpretations falling out from motherhood. But the reality is this, look closely to the issue of the heart. The heart of a child is bound up with foolishness. That means the natural state of childhood is me. It's mehood. It's about me, and I am going to run the show because if it doesn't revolve around me right, you're going to pay for it. You're going to be punished for it. And so the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. That simply means that whatever that rod of correction is, and God has all kinds of rods, and I'm sure we have some variety as well. But the purpose of the rod is to separate the foolish child from the understanding that they're the center of the universe. To introduce to them the fact that actually God's in charge of the universe. And 
unless we surrender and submit to that authority of God, we're going to have a very difficult, unhappy life. Uh, connected with that, what does this foolishness sound like? There's actually two psalms which begin the first verse with this, Psalm 14 and Psalm 53, but the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Okay, so go back to childhood. Go back to childhood. Okay. In the womb, God was intimately watching and caring for the formation and, and observing and making his plan formed in your physical body in the womb. You're born and your attitude is by nature, there's no God. The problem is you're the God. You're the one that everybody has to answer to. And you have a, a way of punishing people. I have never seen much more severe punishment than screaming kids. I mean, we're, just go to the grocery store sometime and watch some screaming, howling kid. And you know, and it's like everybody's watching and the mother has to do something to quiet him or rush him out the store. The fool said as our there's no God. So children, did you know that you are a natural enemy of God? Your natural disposition in any matter is, nah, -uh, I'm not going to do it God's way. Who cares about God? There's no God. I'm God. We're going to do it my way. That's your natural inclination to have it your way. That's who you are. And the result of that is going to be very much trouble for you. You need help. You need a savior. And that's, <clears throat> of course, what we enjoy as Christians. Uh, Proverbs 18, a fool has no delight in understanding. Why is it so hard to teach a child anything? Because they have no delight in it. Now, I've heard in homeschooling circles something called delight-based learning. And I don't want to in any way undermine the fact that if you're recognizing the marvelous works of God, you will get delighted. But you'll be delighted with a kind of worshipful delight. But this kind of delight-based understanding is simply this. Whatever makes me happy is what matters. And so a fool has no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. How many times does a child say, but you're not hearing me, Dad. Well, it sounds like the child's not hearing the dad. The spiritual reality is, as a child, we naturally just want to have fun. I observe in our culture, in American culture, we have so many means and provisions of providing fun for our kids. But I also notice with that provision of fun, that nurturing of this heart pleasing itself is what's taking place. And we're not delighting in understanding. Someone who delights in understanding will, will learn by the grace of God to say no to themselves so they can say yes to minister some need to someone else. That's the nature of the Christian life. But it's not natural for us as human beings. He that trusts in his own heart is a fool. He that trusts in his own heart is a fool. But whoso walks wisely will be delivered. Our need from the infancy is to be separated from trusting in ourselves, from leaning on our own understanding, from delighting in what we like to have delight in, from failure to recognize that there's a God at all. That's, that's what we need to be delivered from. And mom and dad, when you're, when you're correcting your children, if the root of what you're dealing with doesn't get back to that issue, that they're refusing the acknowledgement of God. If you don't deal with that root issue, um, you'll just have some form of manipulation. You can train children, yes, but training them can only be a manipulation of their heart wanting to have its own delight. You manipulate that. You train a child in Jesus, you raise a child up with proper understanding, they learn to say no to themselves. They, they are broken from their will, their willfulness, but they're not broken in their spirit. And I think this is the last one. 
a wise man's heart is in his, his right hand, but a fool's heart is at its left. You know, this is why I'm a conservative and I'm not a liberal. I don't want to be left-handed. Um, from a general understanding, the majority of people have a favor to their right hand versus their left. So that's kind of taken out of this. This is the favored hand, the necessary hand. <clears throat> but a wise man's heart is in his right hand. What is that meaning? Well, it simply means this. If I'm trusting in the Lord, I'm going to have the Lord at my right hand. And I'm going to be listening. I'm going to be getting instruction on purpose. And I'm going to recognize his correction and receive it. But if I'm a fool, I'm going to be following my own understanding, following my own impulse, desiring my own natural delight, and expecting the whole world to operate out of it. That's the simple truth of it. So, and continuing on, I'm going to end just with a brief reference to the verse that we started with, the memory verse. <clears throat> the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to nations. <clears throat> now, I won't continue on with the rest of the passage today, but as I want to close with this thought, I want to ask you a question personally. How does this apply to you? How does this apply to you? In the foregoing verses that we went through, my, my objectives were to help you understand one thing, and that's that God is watching over you. He's intimately involved in the manner in which you were created in the womb. He's aware of every element of your life, your circumstances, where you live, what those circumstances are, what your issues are, what your problems are. He's totally aware of it. And he has what it says here, three things that stand out. Well, first of all, he takes credit for forming you. So you're fearfully, wonderfully made. Thank God for it. Start thanking God for that. But God knew you. God knew you. Now that's, that's a word, that's a pretty common word in the Hebrew, used about a thousand times, and it means all kinds of shades. But essentially, especially when it speaks of God, it means he knows everything about you. Now the part that you and I don't quite understand is that God knows the end from the beginning. Before you're formed, he knows what you're going to look like when you're an old man getting ready to fall into the grave. Or an old woman? Okay. I'll get that in there for you, Nana. But he, he knew you. He knew everything about you. So the question isn't, does God know you? The question is, do you know God? For you were born, are, I sanctified you. Now, here's what I want to share, share in simple terms that you may not fully understand. But the word sanctified means one thing. It means to set apart. When you talk about something being sanctified, something's made holy. And here's something that's imperative that you understand because it'll be the plague of your life if you don't. When God sanctified you in the womb, he said, you're mine. My path for you is going to be my path for you. And your path of happiness is going to be one of surrendering to what I've called you to and how I've called you. That's going to be your lot. And it's not just the prophet. Everyone has a sanctified purpose from the Creator. The question isn't, do you have a sanctified purpose from the Creator? The question is, are you just going to go on and be the stubborn rebel that your sin nature yearns to express, or are you going to surrender and allow the holiness of God to enter your life as he ministers to you on his terms. Are you? Are you going to allow that? And it says, I ordained you, and I could take the word prophet out there and leave it blank. I ordained you. Um, God has a purpose for your life. 
God has a purpose for your life. Now, the truth of the matter is, his purpose for your life may be entirely different than the purpose you want to have for your life. But that's the contest. That's the problem. That's the battle that we have. God has known you. Well, he's formed you. He's known you. He's sanctified you. And he's ordained you for a purpose. So you will continually suffer at your own stubborn will until the day that you surrender to God's purpose in your life. It's an absolute surrender. It's a surrender to his understanding, not to your understanding. It's a surrender to his good purpose. One of the most powerful stories that I heard as a young Christian when I read the um, Through, Great, Through Gates of Splendor account of the murder of the missionary pilots uh, by the Akko Indians in South America and hearing that account of those men gather around a campfire the night before they were leaving. They knew they were going to be landing in a hostile place and they knew that the chance of them being killed was extremely high. But they felt like they had done their homework and they felt that it was time. And as they prayed, excuse me, while they were talking, they had a skillet going in the, um, on top of the fire. And if you've ever been at a campfire, you know that sometimes you'll get a, a little pop of a spark while one little coal explodes and then a little tiny coal goes sailing. So a little coal went sailing into the iron skillet that, had, that still had grease in it. But the little coal was so hot that the whole skillet immediately burst into bright, brilliant flames and burned for a, a couple of minutes until it burned out. It got their attention, and the men prayed this way, Lord, our lives are yours. We're wanting to reach these people with the gospel, but we're putting our welfare in your hands. And we're saying to you, God, if you wish to take our lives and with a spark create a brilliant flame and just consume us up in a moment, so be it, Lord, but be it to your honor and be it to your glory. And the next day, these young men died. They were murdered by the Aqua Indians. But now, as time has worn on, we can see that the brilliance of that flame has echoed throughout Christianity as so many people have been affected in their faith and their trust in the Lord. So the question isn't, are you going to be a Jeremiah? The question is, have you ever paused to think, are you going to be who God's ordained you to be? He has an ordained purpose for you that you can never fulfill until the day that you surrender totally to him. First, you have to come to him as Tim was sharing in the communion message. You have to come to him in the righteousness of Christ, having faith in the shed blood of Christ for your sins. But it's a total surrender. It's not that you can have a happy life. Oh, I think it might be a little bit happier if I get it to be a Christian. No, I'm sorry, it's absolute surrender. This totally, God was the one who formed you. He's the one that set you apart for his purpose and He's ordained you for that purpose, and that's what's going to take place if you'll surrender. I've had so many men come to me frustrated in their middle age, telling me, well, it hasn't turned out like I thought it was. I thought that if you did this and you did that, then I'm going to get this. Now, that's human reasoning. You try hard, you do this, and then you try to get a goal and you try to achieve it. No, God has his own purposes and his own ways. You totally surrender to God. You hold it before him with open hands. That's what you do. And then what God brings to you, you enjoy. And you make the most of it. Because you have an occasion. That attitude that I suggested about some of these moms that have a large brood and they're just so thrilled with the privilege and pleasure of raising these kids, those moms started at one place. Absolute surrender to the Lord. Use my life for however you wish and pour it out. So they're, they're happy at whatever the Lord brings. And so can you be. 
but it involves absolute surrender. It's not about you. Neither is it about somebody else trying to tell you what to do. It's about you having a relationship with God and recognizing from the sacredness of the womb, God has a purpose for you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. We are definitely fearfully and wonderfully made. And that, at least for many, many of us, Lord, our soul knows right well. Father, we are asking now in Jesus' name that you would bless us with that simple understanding and surrender to know that you do know all about us. You know everything about us beyond what we could ever know ourselves. And you have only one set aside purpose. And in our, in our sin and our wickedness and our unholiness, we have blasphemed and we have corrupted that holy purpose you have in our lives as we live by our own understanding. But that holy purpose stands. And we thank you for that, Lord. And I ask that you might grant to your children surrender, surrender to your good purpose at whatever the cost. Thank you, Lord, that not only have you sanctified us and set us apart, that's the heritage of you in our lives. But you've also ordained us. You've ordained us, as Jesus put it, you ordained us to bear fruit. And you're expecting that fruit to be wrought from our lives. So Lord, I ask for, for help. I ask for help on the one hand to be totally surrendered uh, so that we might be willing to be used. Uh, Lord, we might be willing to be abused that we might be willing to give up all of the expectations of our own heart and understanding and be your child, be your servant, and enjoy that wonderful privilege of you preserving us, providing for us, and protecting us as we carry out your ordained purpose. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.